Welcome back to Perfect Pizza at Home. I'm Peter, and you know it's time to make pizzas. We've been preparing our ingredients. We've shown you how to make the doughs, the sauces, some garnishes, everything. But we have to make some choices now. So what we're going to do for demonstration purposes is I've chosen for you a meat lover's pizza. And if you don't eat meat, that's okay. You can make the same pizza, but without the meat. But we have to choose from among the four doughs that we've made. And because this is a kind of a classic American pizza, I'm going to use the American Neapolitan dough. But feel free to mix and match your doughs. You can use any dough under any topping. But this will give us a chance to kind of get one pizza into the oven while we figure out for the other pizzas which ingredients you might like to use. I have a dough here. This is the, the Neapolitan dough. We've already made them into dough balls. I actually formed this dough and took it out of the refrigerator about 90 minutes before it was time to make the pizza so that it could relax a little bit, take the chill off. And you can see that the dough is starting to swell up just a little bit and relax, and that's the key. So I'm going to start to form it, but let's look at some of the ingredients we're going to use for this one. Uh, of course, we need our sauce, and we made our sauce uh, in a previous lesson. It's already thickened up a little bit, but it's thin enough now that it will spread. And of course, my secret ingredient cheese from Mama's Pizzeria, cheddar cheese, our mozzarella cheese, classic pizza cheese, a little dry cheese. You can use Asiago or Romano, but I've got our Parmesan. And these are some garnishes some diced scallions, which I've been soaking in ice cold water and then drained so that they're real fresh. And then I also have some Italian leaf parsley that's been diced finely just so that we can sprinkle. But we're not gonna use these till the pizza comes out of the oven. We've got our meats here. And because it's a meat lover's pizza, we're gonna use three different kinds, but you could use any type you want. We've got some Genoa salami here, really one of my favorites. Uh, some dried Italian salami. You can use any kind. There's soppressata and garlicky kinds or spicy kinds. So you choose whichever one you want. We've got some classic dried hard salami. And then American pepperoni. This is really not an Italian sausage. It's modeled on the Calabrian sausages and, and salamis of southern Italy. But this is American and, of course, the number one favorite topping of all pizza. So we'll use it today. Uh, I've got all this ready. I think we're good to go. I'm going to just sort of chop some of this up. Well, actually, let's come back to that because what I want to do is first get the dough going because it's going to take a couple of steps to get this dough ready for the peel. I've got a little bit of flour here. and I'm going to put a little sprinkle of flour on top because the dough, as you may recall, is a little bit on the tacky and sticky side. I'm going to move this flour a little bit out of the way and I just tap the dough down. I put it in a bed of flour so that it wouldn't stick to the counter and it won't stick to my hands but I'm tapping it down gently. I don't want to overwork this. I don't want to pick it up and squeeze it again because then the dough will tense up and you'll have to wait for it to relax. I've got my bowl scraper here. I can get under it or you can use your metal scraper just to loosen it from the surface. And then I'm going to take a little bit more of that flour, put it on the back of my hands and lift it gently onto my hands. Now you could toss this dough. You could roll it with a rolling pin. Those are options. I don't like tossing this dough because it is a little too tacky and fragile for that. It's not like the, the doughs you see in the New York pizzerias where they toss, which is a harder, higher protein flour and drier. This one's a little too fragile for that. So I'm just going to let the dough do the work by resting it on the back of my hand. And I'm going to use my thumbs to stretch it only from the edge or the cornicion and let gravity do the rest, the stretching. You can see it's getting very thin at the center. And this dough is moving nicely. It's stretching very nicely. But I'm going to lay it down again because I want the, the diameter of this dough to be about 10 to 12 inches. And right now I'm at about 8 inches, but it's not going any further. And if I keep stretching it, it's just going to spring back because the gluten is kicking in. And when the gluten kicks in and it tenses up, it's like a muscle. It cramps up, and then it won't let you stretch it anymore until you give it a rest. It only takes a minute or so for it to rest. But while it's resting, this would be a good time to return to our salamis and actually start to prepare them. And because we want to sprinkle this and have every bite of the pizza uh, include a bite of every kind of salami, I'm going to cut them into small pieces. You're also, also welcome, of course, if you were only using one type, to put the full circles on there. So we've got some salami ready to sprinkle on the pizza. We'll get this hard salami. And then, of course, we have this pepperoni, which you could leave in the little circles, but I'll cut them into quarters. All these are personal choices that every pizzaiolo, who's the person who makes the pizza, gets to make, and you get to make them in this case. Now let's go back to the dough, which has had a, 
uh, a few minutes now to rest. The gluten has relaxed and I should be able to lift it again. Now be careful when you're doing the second lift because it's now stretched, it's thin in the center, a little thicker around the edge. We're not going to form an actual thick ridge. It will puff on its own at the ridge, but I want to get a little flour again on the back of my hands because that will keep it from sticking. Gently get under it and rest it on your hands. And see what we're doing here is using your thumb to stretch it only at the point of the edge. And the center will follow. It comes on its own. And now I'm going to lay it down one more time and prepare the peel. You can see that we now have a really nice almost 12 inch circular disc of pizza dough. Thinner in the center. Very fragile there. We don't want it so thin that it rips. So we have to be careful and I want to prepare the peel by putting a small amount of flour. You could use semolina, you could use cornmeal, some people like that. I find that those ingredients tend to burn when they go in the oven. So I like just regular flour and only enough to keep the dough from sticking. So you just kind of want to wipe it on. And I'm using a wooden peel because I like wood for the loading side. I'll use a metal, thin metal peel for unloading. But if you only have one kind of peel, metal or wood, you can use them for both of these steps. I just prefer when I have both kinds to use the wood to get it in because dough tends to not stick to wood as much as it sticks to metal and the thinner metal ones for getting it out. I'm ready to now transfer this to the peel. So I'm going to, I got my peel floured, ready to go. I'm going to lift it and just slide it on here. And at this point, we've got the perfect disc and we can go ahead and start to put the ingredients on here to make our pizza. And the first thing we want to put down is the sauce. One of the common mistakes that not only home pizza makers make, but even pizzerias make is too much sauce. In Naples, they have the right idea. You just want to kiss the dough with the sauce enough to just cover the whole surface, but not to swim in it. We're not trying to make stewed tomatoes. We're just trying to lay a base of sauce down. So we'll go ahead and put a small ladleful. Use the back of your ladle to spread it. And if you need to put more on, you can always put more on. But gently spread it around to cover the surface of the dough. You can see the particulates, the little tomato solids that are in from these uh, crushed tomatoes that we used. And if you want to use something that's less chunky than this, you can either put these tomatoes in a food processor or just buy ground tomatoes instead. And you'll get a smoother surface of tomatoes. But I love these little flavor bursts. For me, pizza is all about delivering flavor. It's the perfect flavor delivery system when you think about it. And part of that is, is because there's pockets of flavor. So now we've got our tomatoes on here, just enough to cover the surface. And it's time to put the cheeses and other toppings on. You can put the meat on first, you can put the cheese on first. But since the cheese is going to melt and we want these meat slices to kind of crisp up in the oven, we'll put the cheese on first. A little bit of cheddar, not too much. And again, you don't have to use cheddar cheese if you don't want to. If it offends you because you're an Italian purist, that's okay. You don't have to put cheddar. You can use fontina. You can use any kind of cheese. Just simply stick with mozzarella. Provolone is also a good choice. We don't want this laden with a lot of cheese, but enough to do the job. I love melted cheese, and I love grilled cheese sandwiches, as many of you probably do. Uh, but again, high quality cheese doesn't require a lot of cheese to get the job done, just enough to melt and cover the surface. You get to make that call yourself. It's not my decision, it's yours, but this is the way I like it. And a little bit of dried cheese, not a lot, because it doesn't really melt that much, but it provides a lot of flavor and adds that extra saltiness that brings everything alive. And then a sprinkling of our meats. So we've got our Genoa salami going on. We want to spread it enough so that every slice that we make, because you know people are going to all want a slice of this after you make it, uh, it's going to show up in every slice, a little bit of the hard, dry salami. You can make these any size or matchsticks or little bits. You could also use prosciutto ham. Bacon is great here. Chicken is excellent on a meat lover's pizza as well. Okay, and then our classic American pepperoni. It's not the pepperoni's a bad topping, although Italian purists feel that it's you know, a blatant ripoff of the better quality Italian cheeses, which is true. But what gives it this beautiful color, this sort of salmon red color, is paprika. And paprika is, it, which is dried peppers. Um, the paprika is the secret ingredient in pepperoni, and we do love paprika. It's a great flavor. And pepperoni, for all the bad press that it gets, 
is the number one selling topping, so there must be something about it that people love, and I think it is that spiciness. All right, now we've got our garnishes. We're not gonna use those yet, but what I wanna do is now take this to the oven. Before I do, I wanna make sure I'm gonna be able to slide it off of the peel and anything that's fallen off, get back on there. So you jiggle it and you just go back and forth, not in long strokes, just little vibrations, just to make sure it's sliding, which it is, which means we can now take it to the oven. So I'm heading over there and I'll put it in. The oven has been preheating at the highest setting. And in this particular case, it's convection. 500 degrees is as high as it will go. I'll take that. That's equal to 550 without convection. So you can just use the highest setting that your oven will allow. And if you have convection, use it. So now I'm at the oven and you can see that I have a pizza stone in here that's been heating. I'm gonna slide this pizza on by jiggling it back and forth gently, vibrating it off to keep it in one place. I don't wanna go all in in one motion because it's do or die and if it flips over, you have a calzone instead of a pizza. But let me talk about that pizza stone for a second because this pizza is gonna take approximately five to six minutes to bake. In a wood-fired oven, it might take a minute and 30 seconds to bake because they're baking at 800 degrees. Pizzerias bake at about 600 to 650, but this oven only goes up to 500 degrees with convection, as most home ovens do. So we won't get them out as fast, which is one of the reasons why we work with a wetter dough to begin with, so that it can sustain that longer bake time to still retain some moisture when it comes out of the oven. But the, what the pizza stone does is it's a thermal mass that absorbs the heat while the oven is preheating and then radiates it back into the base of the pizza so we get a little bit more puff, a little bit more oven spring. Now, if you don't have a pizza stone, you can improvise one. You could use something like this, a, a baking pan flipped over. That will be a platform. It's not as thick. It doesn't hold as much heat as a pizza stone would. So, but it will work. It will be a platform. And worst case scenario, you could just set your pizza on a sheet pan and put it into the oven. It will take longer for the heat to go through the pan to get to the bottom of your pizza, but it's better than nothing, right? First choice, pizza stone, the thicker the slab, the better. A one inch pizza stone will hold more heat than a half an inch or a quarter of an inch, but any pizza stone will work. It could be round, it could be rectangular, it can be square. And to just take a quick peek at this pizza now, it's only been in for about a minute and a half, but look how it's starting to puff up. And you can see the, it's already forming a cornicione, or the, that crown. And it's puffing up very nicely. It hasn't browned, but we're starting to get some brown spots. And what I'm going to do is now take my other peel. I'm gonna go in under it. And this is why I like this thin one. And just give it a little bit of a turn, maybe a 180 because no matter how new your oven is, no matter how good it is, no oven bakes evenly front and back, side to side. Convection is more even than non-convection. Um, usually it's hotter on the sides and in the back than in the front. So by giving it a little bit of a rotation about halfway through the bake, you will get a more even bake of the pizza. So now this pizza is, is, is in there. It's, it's uh, gonna bake until it's done. We'll know it's done when we see that golden brown color in the cornicion. And uh, the next uh, step will be to remove it and garnish it. Okay, so what I'm seeing is, is that there's a little bit of caramelization around the edges. I'd like to see a little more color underneath, the underskirt of the pizza. Again, caramelization is the browning of the crust. Just a few extra seconds, and then we're gonna pull it out. Okay, this looks done. We can see beautiful golden brown uh, coloration around the sides, and I think it's ready to be garnished. I've got my scallions here. I'm just gonna put a little sprinkle, not only for the green color, but for that little flavor burst that the scallions will provide. And they will wilt a little bit into the hot pizza. And just to kind of boost that coloring, we'll give some parsley, which again provides a lot of nice brightness. And you'll notice that the contrast of the green with the other ingredients is an important part of presentation. And, and at Johnson & Wales, where I teach, we teach our students about the appropriateness of garnish, how important it is for enhancement, not only the visual appeal, because we eat first with our eyes, but also because it has to be an appropriate flavor combination with what you're serving it upon. And in this case, both the parsley and the scallions are a great complement 
to the meats and the sauce and the cheese that's on here. So now that we've got it garnished, and you can see again how the, the color and the flavors really will pop from this garnish and from the combination of ingredients, we'll cut it into some wedges. And you can make this into eight, into six. Typically in a restaurant, you would cut these into six. In Italy, a pizza like this might be just served unsliced, and you would almost roll it up and eat it with a knife and a fork or kind of fold it into a sandwich and eat it like that. That's how they do it in Naples. In the United States, not so much. We're all about slices here. So let's slice it. We'll do eight slices. And what I want to see at the end is whether I can actually hold the slice up. You can see that it can, it's holding up slightly. It's kind of what we call shelving here. It's, it's down at the bottom. But it's, if you look at the bottom of this pizza, we can see that there's still a little bit of flour dust on there. It's not quite as brown as you can get it, which indicates to me that we maybe we could bake it for an extra 30 seconds. We have some room, there's flexibility. It depends on how you like it. We've got a little bit of char here. I like that char flavor because it gives it a smokiness. Some people prefer it a little bit lighter. This one kind of fell in the middle. So New York style, you roll the nose of that slice up, make sure you don't burn yourself, and let's taste it to see if the flavors really do come together. Mm. See, this is like a perfect pizza because you've got that melted cheese, you've got the meats, you've got the sauce. In just the right proportion, everything's balancing. The edge of the pizza, you can see some aeration, some hole patterns here. That's a good thing. It's even more prominent. On this slice, we love to see that bubbling of the crust. So these are the qualities that we're looking for that would differentiate just a good pizza from a great pizza. And this one's ready to be shared with my crew here. And um, we'll come back and make a Sicilian pizza in just a second. Now I'm going to show you a couple of ways of doing a Sicilian style or pan pizza. And can also be used to make focaccia. Remember that sticky Sicilian dough that we made? That's what we're going to use for this. And, I, and there's two ways that we can actually bake these pizzas. You can see that we have one that is actually par-baked. I took two pounds, four ounces of that dough, lined the pan with baking parchment, or you can use a silicon pad, mainly because these pans have been used and I don't want the metallic flavor of the, of the pan to penetrate the bottom of this dough or discolor it. And I took that dough, put it on top of that parchment, which I oiled very generously with olive oil, and I pressed it in to fill the pan and then we went ahead and baked it, and par-baked it for about 15 to 20 minutes until we just started to see some caramelization, some browning, and even the bottom of the dough is just set, but not fully brown because this is gonna get baked a second time. I also have a cake pan here, and because these cake pans are so new, they don't even need to be lined with parchment, but if you have old, well-used cake pans, you can cut a piece of parchment into a circle and line it with that. I oiled the pan and pressed it. In fact, this is how I did it, because I've got a little bit of dough left. Enough oil to really cover that surface and the side walls. And then we just take this dough, about 10 ounces of dough, and just drop it right into the pan. You can see how soft and sticky this dough still is. The hydration of this dough is about 80% water to flour, as opposed to 68 to 70% water in a pizza dough. I'm going to put a little bit more olive oil on here just to keep my fingers from sticking to it, and I'm going to start to press it or dimple it into the dough. And you'll notice also that because the dough has been shocked a little bit from getting out of the bowl, that it tends to slide back. Just let it rest. It's that gluten kicking in again. And once that rests a little bit, we can dimple it. It might take two or three dimplings before it fills the pan, but then it's done and ready to be used. You can either let it rise, as I've done here, or you can immediately start making your pizza and take it to the oven. When you let it rise first, it's kind of more like a focaccia. And when you bake it right away, it's more in the Sicilian style. So we'll return to this one later and assemble a pizza. But let's turn these into pizzas. So I've got the one that's ready here in the pan, 
And I've also got this. I'm gonna assemble this one first, the large par-baked pizza, and I have sliced tomatoes. You can make a regular pizza on here. You can put sauce and cheese. We call those grandma pizzas. They're classic. They're, you see them in every Italian bakery in, across America, uh, and they're wonderful. But I'm gonna do something a little bit different just to give you an option. Remember this herb oil that we made earlier in a previous lesson? I'm gonna stir it up, and I'm going to use a fair amount of this to marinate these tomatoes in the herb oil. I'm not gonna use it all up because I wanna save a little bit to marinate some clams for a clam pizza that I'm gonna make later. But here we've got this sliced tomatoes. These are Roma style tomatoes because they're not as juicy as regular garden tomatoes. And that's good because we don't want all that juice to have to bake off. You could even, if you wanted to, oven roast these tomatoes to dry them further, but you don't have to. But because these are now marinated, we've added a lot of added flavor to the tomatoes. So I'm just going to lay them across the top of this dough, and I'm going to cover the whole surface of the dough with these marinated tomatoes. You'll notice that these tomatoes are sliced about a quarter of an inch thick, and they're all kind of coated. I'm gonna take a little bit of this juice that's left in the bowl and just drizzle it all over the top because there's a lot of flavor in here now. And we wanna get that flavor in the tomatoes. I want you to also notice that these tomatoes are creating a nice contrast on top of the pizza dough because they're red and the dough is white underneath. But everything's gonna change when we put it in the oven because the dough is gonna turn browner and the, the tomatoes are gonna wash out a little bit. So they will not be as dramatically contrasted when they come out of the oven. So we're gonna remedy that by garnishing it with pesto when it comes out of the oven. We could put it on now, but it would be better and more brilliant when it goes on after it comes out of the oven. So this one is ready to go. And now we're going to go ahead and prepare the other pizza. We'll do this in a more traditional form with sauce. Of course, we have that nice sauce that we've been using on our pizzas that we made in a previous lesson. And I'm gonna spread this out and you'll see that immediately this dough will start to fall because I've been letting it rise. And that's okay because I'm gonna, with my fingers, just spread it out and dimple it in. And as it dimples in, this dough will collapse a little bit, but it will pop back up when it goes in the oven. We don't want a super thick dough, but we want it to be thicker and kind of crunchier than a normal uh, thin crusted pizza dough. This is a whole different style pan pizza. This is not deep dish pizza, even though it's baked in a pan, it's pan pizza. And we'll finish it off with a little bit of cheese. We've got some uh, of our uh, Asiago, which is a dry aged cheese, again, for nice flavor. But as a good melter, we have Fontina, wonderful alternative to say mozzarella or provolone. But you could also use any of those cheeses. In fact, we will use a little bit of our standard low moisture mozzarella. I'm not gonna put the fresh mozzarella on this because it will melt too much and will burn before it finishes baking. And maybe just garnish it at this point with a little bit of scallions. They'll lose their bright color when they come out of the oven, but they'll nicely melt into the cheese. And then we can finish garnishing it when it comes out of the oven. Let's take a look at this one, the one that needed some resting, and let's see what happens when we dimple it again after a short resting period. You can see now the gluten's relaxed, and this dough is just about filling the pan. Probably one more resting period, because you see it's sliding back. One more resting period should allow us to fill the pan, and we can make a pizza out of that as well. We're ready to bake these. This one's going to be garnished when it comes out with pesto. This one will be finished off with a little parsley. Two ways of doing Sicilian or pan pizza. And I'm going to take them to the oven. I'm not going to bake them on the stone, but on the wire rack so that the heat can penetrate from the oven directly through to the bottom of the pan. And this one will probably take about 15 minutes. This one will take about uh, the same amount of time or less, it depends. But because we par-bake the dough first, it won't take the 30 minutes that it would take if we had to put it in with a raw dough. Okay, to the oven. So while the pizzas are in the oven baking, I got an idea. I want to do a chiffonade of fresh basil as an additional garnish for this pan pizza. So you take a few leaves of fresh basil and roll them up like a cigar. Take a sharp knife 
and just cut threads like that. And you want to do this right before you put it on because if you leave them sit for a while, they'll tend to turn brown. But right now we have now threads of fresh basil that can be, and if you think that you want them shorter, you just cut them across like that. And we can sprinkle this right over the top of the pizza, which will give us that classic uh, margarita effect of basil, fresh basil, sauce, and cheese. And I think this first pizza is about ready to come out. So let's go get it. All right, look at this pizza. We've got this caramelized cheese, which is great. We have it just where we want it. The edge of the pizza is turning beautiful brown. We should have a nice crisp bottom. I'm going to hold this pan because it's hot. Go around the whole perimeter with my plastic bowl scraper and then just slide it onto the cutting board so that we can cut it up and serve it. See, it comes out nice and clean. We have that olive oil on the bottom, which will actually cook right into the bottom of the crust. And now we've got our basil, and we'll put some of that over the top. Again, the green contrasts very nicely with the red and the white. So in a way, this is kind of a pan pizza version of a pizza margarita, which I will also make on our uh, true Napolitana dough, a real margarita, but this is uh, almost like a Sicilian version of a margarita. We could even enhance it a little bit more with some freshly chopped flat leaf Italian parsley. And now we've got a lot of green, red, and white showing beautiful pizza. Uh, I'm going to go check on the sheet pan pizza, the, the uh, one that was par-baked, and see if that's ready as well. So that one's not quite ready, which gives us a chance to cut this pizza and see how this one turned out. We're going to cut right through it again. And you can see that with this pizza, it's a thicker crust than with our hand-stretched pizza because it's a Sicilian-style pizza. It's almost like a focaccia. Focaccia is the pizza of northern Italy. Uh, Sicilian pizza in Sicily, they call it sfingioni, which uh, is a, a name that never quite caught on in the United States. In the Tuscany region, they call it schiacciata. All these are just variations on a theme. Remember, pizza is just dough with something on it. And the type of dough, the amount of dough, the ratio of dough to toppings can vary in an infinite number of manners. All of them can become memorable pizza if the dough is great and the, the quality of the toppings is excellent. And we've achieved all of that here. We can serve this in wedges. You could also cut these in squares. There's a lot of ways you can go with that. Let's take a look at one of these pieces now. And in fact, I even have that spicy oil that we made. Let's put a little bit of that over this, just for the fun of it. It's pretty strong, so we want to stir up the, all the goodies that have settled to the bottom, which are those chili pepper flakes and things like that. There's some fresh garlic in here. The smoked paprika has given this a beautiful bronzed copper tone. And we just drizzle a little bit of this over the, the top. Again, it's all about flavor delivery. Pizza is the perfect flavor delivery system. Let's take a bite, and that should bring us right up to, you can see just the beginning of browning on the underskirt of the pizza. Hmm. Because there's a higher ratio of dough to toppings here, a few slices are going to be very, very filling. The thinner crust of pizzas, you can eat twice as many. Some people prefer it to be all about the dough, some to be more about the toppings. Let's go look at our sheet pan pizza and bring that over and finish that off. Ah, look at that. And you can hear the sizzling of the oil. We've got a beautiful pan pizza. I'm going to use my bench blade to go all the way around the surface, make sure it's not sticking anywhere. And then before I put the uh, final garnish on, which is our pesto, I'm going to slide it out of the pan onto these boards. You might need two cutting boards. You can see that the tomatoes may want to slide off. We can always put them back on. If the parchment paper comes with the pizza, don't burn yourself trying to save it. You can always pull it off afterwards. I'm going to put that tomato right back in place. Any juice or oil that's left in the pan drizzles right over the top of the pizza. Again, pure flavor. And now we've got a full-size Sicilian pizza. I'm going to let this cool for a second. 
before I pull the paper out, because I don't want to burn myself, but what I am going to do is put some of this bright green pesto that we made, stir it up. See, the lemon juice has preserved that color. And you'll notice again that while the tomatoes have washed out a little bit and the, the contrast is not so stark between the dough and the toppings, the basil pesto restores that by bringing this greenness to it. So now we have one of the principles of garnishing, movement, energy, eye-popping contrast. All of these are things that garnishes do. And in this case, also an enhancement of flavor because now we're adding cheeses, we're adding garlic, and all sorts of other flavor. Another way of creating a flavor, um, another way of creating a flavor delivery system here using ingredients on top of a great tasting dough. I'm going to spread this now with the back of my spoon just to kind of press it into the tomatoes and let it melt and spread on its own. Now, if you decide that you like pesto more cooked, which I think is uh, something Americans tend to do more than Italians, is, is putting it on before you cook things, like on chicken breasts and even on pizza. You can, you can put the pesto on here and it will melt onto the tomatoes, but you will lose that bright green. Of course, you could always put another layer of fresh pesto when it comes out, but you don't really need it if you think about it. Look how, how colorful this is and how dramatic it is. And I think that's, again, what garnishes do is add drama. Okay, that's pretty much done. Let's cut into it and see what we've got. And you can make these squares uh, large or small. You can kind of use the tomatoes to guide your rows. In fact, this might be a good place for me to stop and get that parchment out from under it. So I'm going to do that because you can see as I cut it, it's a lot harder to cut through the parchment than it is to just cut through the focaccia. So I'm going to kind of lift it and slide my parchment paper out. Kind of jiggle it until it comes and we'll throw that part away. Okay, now I can continue cutting. Again, because this is a thicker dough, and you can see that we've got almost a half an inch or so of crust underneath. We don't have to make big slices. These, these slices are great for, for instance, this size for appetizers. If you have company coming, you could put out a whole tray of these. They're almost like little bite-sized mini pizzas that people could walk away with. I love the large, irregular holes. That's a real hallmark of a, of a quality artisan dough are large, irregular holes as opposed to tight, um, small holes because it allows more heat to penetrate, roasting the grains, getting deeper flavor, and actually fulfilling what we call the baker's mission, which is to evoke the full potential of flavor trapped in the grain. There's a lot of flavor in flour, but it only comes out through long, slow fermentation and proper baking technique. So let's see if we can get a little crunch factor here. Mm. I can feel it. I don't know if you can hear it. Just lost my tomato. But I'm getting the crunchiness of the dough, the sweet creaminess of the interior of the crust. And the creaminess is part of what makes a pizza crust memorable. This is memorable dough because it's not like something you can buy in any neighborhood pizzeria. It's something you have to know how to do. So, we've made Sicilian pizza, pan pizza, showing you how to stretch a pizza dough. I've got a lot of other doughs to play with here. Our country dough, I'm gonna make a three mushroom pizza on that one, where I've sliced and, and uh, sauteed some wild shiitake mushrooms along with criminis along with some regular commercial mushrooms, sliced them, sauteed them with garlic, olive oil, finish them off with a little salt and pepper. We're going to put that on top of a pizza with fontina cheese to get that really nice melty quality. And uh, when it comes out of the oven, I'm going to garnish it 
with a little truffle oil, white truffle oil, just a small amount at the end to make all the mushroom flavors pop. Now that pizza could be made on any of our doughs, but I'm gonna do the country dough for that one, just because it sounds like a great combo. Mushrooms are so earthy. The dough itself has an earthy quality. We've got our Napolitana dough. I'll make a classic margarita on that. We have um, more of our Neapolitan dough, and I've been marinating uh, clams in the excess herb oil that we didn't use on top of this pizza. So that's going, I'm gonna put some of our uh, Caccia Cavallo cheese, that, that aged provolone, underneath that, put some of this, um, these seasoned clams on that, uh, and again, we'll garnish it with some, some parsley and some uh, basil when it comes out. In other words, we can make any number of pizzas. We've got a lot of ingredients. We've given you many ideas on the, uh, on the resource material in your uh, Craftsy platform, so download those, use those as starting points, create your own topping ideas. There's really an infinite number. If you have a favorite pizzeria that does a topping, you can do that topping as well. Share your ideas, uh, communicate with one another, show us some pictures, we'd love to hear from you. We're building a community of pizza makers, of people making perfect pizza at home. We've given you all the tools for how to do it. Only thing left to do is to do it. There you have it. We've been having a lot of fun and made a lot of pizzas using up all these ingredients, these fabulous ingredients that we've gathered. And it's just a drop in the bucket of what you can do and all the different kinds of pizzas that can be made just using the techniques that we've talked about, uh, choices of cheese, toppings, creativity. Have at it. It's a lot of fun. I'm Peter Reinhardt. Thanks for joining me on Perfect Pizza at Home. Now it's your turn. Go forth, make that perfect pizza, and let's stay in touch.